Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the many wonderful benefits of community gardens and a vision for the future of these essential community assets with our special guests, Lynn Kelly, Executive Director of the New York Restoration Project, Georgina Griffith-Yates, Executive Director of the Wasatch Community Gardens, and Linda Apple-Lipsius, Executive Director of Denver Urban Gardens. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited. Uh, so I pulled a weed or two in my day. <laughs> uh, I am basically, when it comes to gardening, uh, unskilled labor, but I really enjoy it. And I'm getting more and more into sort of these benefits of, of gardening and watching things grow and also acquiring the skills because there are so many skills that we're disconnected from if we live in urban environments. And those of us who live in rural environments really have retained. So, uh, Lynn, I'm going to go to you because you have, um, in in your environment, in New York City, this asphalt environment, it's very connected to places where I grew up, aside from working on ranches and so on and so forth, uh, which I've done periodically. I've mostly grown up in urban environments. So talk a little bit about why it's important in an urban environment like New York to have green spaces and to have gardens and to have people actually working and getting their hands dirty. Sure, and Mark, thank you for having me. It's uh, exciting to be here with colleagues from other parts of the US. Uh, I look forward to learning about your work as well. So uh, at New York Restoration Project, um, we were formed nearly three, 30 years ago, uh, founded by Bette Midler with a very simple concept in mind, which was roll up your sleeves, pick up some trash, help your neighbor clean up a park. And where we've evolved today, um, and this comes back to the sort of the New York question about why this is important, is we now have 52 community gardens as a part of a land trust all throughout the city. Um, we manage 80 acres of parkland um, on behalf of the city of New York, much like a conservancy. And we build about 20 new green spaces a year um, through a program called Gardens for the City. So we've built well over 325, 350 in, in our existence. And why is this important? Well, Mark, you've rightly said, like New York is dense, it's urban, it's built up, it's part, you know, it is the uh, concrete city, right? And so New Yorkers really use these green spaces. We don't have backyards, right? We don't have front yards, many of us. Um, so this is our an extension of our living room, of our gym, of our de facto senior center, of our uh, classroom. Um, these green spaces allow us to live our lives um, and not just to get outside, but to give us more room, more peace of mind and better health benefits overall. They're vital to uh, our existence in New York. And a stress stress reliever, right? I mean, absolutely. You can do everything from exercise to read a book to just, you know, when you live, when you live multiple people in a space that may max be, if you're lucky, 700 square feet, right? You need to get outside. So you can imagine, um, especially during the last couple of years, uh, during the height of the pandemic, how important in New York City these spaces were. Now, Georgina, you have a different environment uh, over in Utah. And, and I'm, uh, again, I'm very fascinated. I'm, I live in the West, so water is always an issue. Yeah. Really, in a, in a place like uh, Utah, talk a little bit about your take on this, because you don't, you don't uh, hunger for land. I mean, there's a lot of space, but there's a different set of uh, challenges that you face. Yeah, and it's um, Wasatch Community Gardens is based in Salt Lake City, uh, which is the most um, densely urban populated uh, city in the state, um, and and so we're we're kind of dealing with those two things at the same time: this rapid development um, of the city, as well as this water conservation, especially as we see our lake. Um, our Great Salt Lake going through uh, some devastating changes. And so for us, it's really important to have a conversation, not just around green space, but the way that we talk about it is productive green space, making sure that we're use, utilizing water, not just for um, uh, a patch of grass, 
Um, but for, for productive use, whether that's a pollinator plant, um, food providing, whether we're regenerating the soil through cover crops. Um, and so we're really prioritizing that productive piece of green space so that the water that we do use is going right back towards um, our food system as a whole. And so that's one way that we're able to um, to work within this, this interesting time of living in a desert and a drought um, although we did get a great amount of snow in the last few weeks. Um, and so, yeah, it's just been, it's been really interesting, but getting people to think more about water use with productivity um, in mind. And, and you're also thinking about using every drop of water multiple times. Mm. Right? The, the way we've been taught to farm, the way we've been taught to use water is as if it's uh, infinitely available, and we mm-hmm. we use it we use it once, and then it evaporates uh, into the air. You're you're dealing with things like water capture, mm-hmm. water recycling. Um, you're you're dealing with the fact that now that you have a a great snowpack, um, how do you not squander that snowpack? Right. Um, and uh, knowing that, of course, not all of that is in, in control. And Linda, you have a different situation. We've seen with the fires that recently cropped up across Colorado, that Colorado itself is also heavily impacted by uh, climate change and the and the, uh, the the changes that that are resulting as they are all across the United States and particularly the West, these massive fires. We had huge massive fires across our patch in in California. Talk a little bit about uh, Denver's approach to urban gardens and how that uh, part of the state is uh, using gardens to improve the uh, quality of life and retain the quality of life for which Colorado is so famous. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, yeah, we're neighbors, uh, of course, with Georgina. Uh, so we're also living in the desert, the high desert here. Um, yeah, I mean, community gardens, the way that we're framing them, you know, yes, they produce food, um, but very much um, in addition, climate, community, and food. Um, and then with the outcome of health and wellness um, and then skill building along the way. So in terms of quality of life, in terms of, you know, helping heal the ecosystem and the environment, Uh, You know, in our gardens, we also, you know, practice regenerative practices, uh, you know, healing the soil, increasing biodiversity. Um, I think something that's been really, really interesting and tapped into is sort of the the mental health and wellness um, piece that comes with it, because with these these little gardens, these little patches of land, you know, people are feeling so demoralized and so frustrated with the climate, uh, you know, reality that we're living in now. And so, so providing education and skills in a way that, that, you know, every member of the community um, can help give back is something that, you know, and help heal, uh, you know, the planet is something that's been really interesting. So uh, yeah, so very, it's very holistic and, you know, and I think um, they're just, there's so much more, you know, to that and, and add tremendously to the quality of life for the folks who are, you know, who are growing in community. I'd like to talk a little bit about the future that we're buying for ourselves. I have this this theory. It's really it's really gelled over the last couple of years that the way we spend our money, the way we spend our time, the way we communicate with each other, what we learn, it's actually buying our future. To what extent are are you um, uh, behaving in a way where you're creating um, constituents, volunteers, staffs, um, and and the people with whom you come in contact with? that will shape a future of America that is more uh, sustainable, uh, more equitable, more enjoyable. I mean, because look, the the country was founded on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? Are you part of that idea? It's not just about gardens, it's about creating people, helping people to create the future that will realize in this very subtle way, uh, an America where people can be happier, where people can be more self-sufficient, where resources are better utilized, and where we're ameliorating impacts of human beings on on, on us all. Uh, Georgina, you, you care to uh, give give it a first cut, and then we'll go to Lynn. Yeah, and you touched on two of my uh, three. 
um, words, which are sustainable, uh, equitable. And then our third one is intentional, right? How are we making sure that as we're um, in this space that we're intentional on our future? And right now we're creating um, or we're executing this five-year plan that we have because we see this huge gap. And while people are really you know, tightening up their purse strings, unsure of the economy right now, we're seeing, uh, and I'm sure my colleagues are seeing the same thing, more and more demand on services as our um, communities turn inwards towards themselves and each other. And so we're looking at um, in, in the community garden space, being more intentional with where we put our gardens, um, making sure that we're uh, we're collaborating with local community centers to um, help people engage with more than one resource at a time. We're also looking at um, creating a program that teaches uh, urban farmers how to farm in an urban setting and um, and in a desert because we're able to use 52% of the average U.S. vegetable farm with 17 times the output of produce. And so we want to be able to teach other local farmers how to do that and emerging farmers because if you read the Young Farmers of America report, you see that lack of education and access to land are the biggest barriers into getting into growing food. And so we're trying to look not just at community gardens, but our food system and the, the resources available to those who want to grow food for our community, for those who might not be able to access a community garden. And so we're really looking at this um, in a multi-disciplinary uh, way so that our food system can be bolstered across the board in our community. Plus, you're taking the logistics out of it. If you don't have to transport as far. Correct. correct. Strawberries from Mexico, uh, you know, that's great. But if, if you don't have to drive a truck from Mexico to bring strawberries, but you're growing them... Uh, close to home oh, uh, yeah. but in so many other ways, right? And half of our food goes out of state. And so we want to make sure that we're keeping, we're keeping food in our state. <laughs> so Lynn, um, is, is growing food a big part of what you're doing or is it mostly about green sp spaces in New York? You have so much less land. You do have 80 acres under management, you mentioned, uh, but you have so much less land. Is is growing food a big part of this, or is it mostly if, if food is grown, it's really part of the 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 growing thing? It's not really uh, uh, there to help nourish people as much in in a in a place like New York. Oh no, I, it is very much a part of uh, unfortunately addressing food insecurity in New York, which has only gotten greater in the last couple of years um, due to pandemic and economic downturn in the city. So while we always had a practice of our gardeners, our volunteer gardeners growing food, um, we found that during the pandemic, there was an uptick of requests of, can you build more beds for us? Can you give us starts instead of seeds, like the actual plants to advance the growing cycle? Um, it what used to be growing food for just uh, education or enjoyment is now or even to maybe pass on cultural um, foods or, you know, produce within a family generations. It's now like if I don't grow this, I might not have access to it. I might know a neighbor that might not get any of it. So our policy is anything that's grown in our gardens and it's thousands of pounds of produce a year is distributed for free within that community. Um, we don't have any sort of market or anything like that, but it's because there is still so much food insecurity. Um, you know, you Mark, you started with a question about like, what are we passing on, right? Like what's the next thing? And um, I, was at a we we hosted a lecture last week on biodiversity, which was really fascinating. And but what my takeaways from the two experts in listening to them, which really resonated with me, was that you know right now we talk a lot about rights in the country. What are our rights? Because as you know, rights are being violated left and right. But this person said we should also be talking about our responsibilities in terms of what we're passing along and what are your values. And I think about that with the work with uh, New York Restoration Project, because we're a greening organization, we're an environmental justice organization, but at the focus of it all are New Yorkers, it's people. So what we pass along to the next generation has to come out of the values of the people here today. Um, and that's something that we think about quite a bit. We never assume 
We have experts in horticulture, agriculture on our team, but only a community member is an expert in their own neighborhood. And so we listen and try to execute on that. If I can actually interject and build on that too, I mean, you know, what are we, what are we setting up for the future? You know, I think as a country um, and as a culture in general, we're suffering from this epidemic of loneliness. Um, and I think community gardens are, you know, we view, you know, yes, food is absolutely important and critical to the mission, but bringing people together to work, you know, where you've got, you know, the lawyer and you've got the teacher and you've got the plumber all, you know, all coming together to grow food. It's completely apolitical and it's reteaching people how to live in community. And when you do, I mean, and that just uncovers, we just had a study come out that was published in The Lancet, looking at the reduction in depression and anxiety and isolation and loneliness that comes from working in a community garden. So it's really, it's such a unique um, construct where people can come together repeatedly, you know, and, and learn or relearn how to work together and thrive and sort of get all the benefits that come from that. I want to ask you all about this, this notion of community that you all have raised. It seems like in America, we are becoming increasingly obsessed about telling other people who are not like us, um, or even people who, who are like us, how they should behave or what they should be able to do. Um, it seems like um, you have uh, people who define their rights in certain ways that impinge on the rights of others, the rights to feel safe, or the right to um, to have reproductive control over your own body, or the rights to dress as you particularly want or, or identify as you particularly want. Um, it seems like this mutuality, this community that you're talking about, is kind of under attack. Uh, do you see that as part of, of, of what you're trying to do as you're creating a community to help people to communicate, to connect to each other, instead of feeling so alone and isolated, feeling so defensive that you pull out a gun when somebody, um, you know, knocks on your door um, who who is younger or of a different race than you are? That that are, Is that part of what you're doing? You know, I'm not insensible to the fact that we have four people here who are white. We have three women and one guy. Okay. I'm not insensible to the fact that we've seen in the news these, these divisions that seem to metastasize here. And you're talking about community. How how do you all see this? Linda, you want to give it a give it a first cut? Yeah, I mean, I see this as um as an extraordinary opportunity, actually, to, to get people to see, to see each other. And, you know, and, and speaking about people with, you know, different backgrounds, I mean, with all of us, you know, all the community gardens have, um, you know, people from every background, you know, we have a significant immigrant refugee community and, uh, you know, in our gardens, we, over 40 languages are spoken. And in the gardens are ways for people to share and for people to observe and to see sort of different, you know, practices and, and understand too that the learnings go every direction. Um, you know, you see, you see vegetables grown that you've never seen. You learn about traditions that you've never seen, whether it's from somebody who's around, who lives or comes from the other side of the world or, you know, just, you know, a couple neighborhoods away. So, I mean, I think it's a, it is a very basic foundational way for people to see each other and to, and to talk to each other um, that, you know, it's, it's, it's a step that, that I think is very, you know, positive and empowering too. And these kinds of behaviors have been dismissed, right, Lynn? I mean, it, it, it's so often that the important stuff is the, I don't know, the political stuff or whatever, but actually this kind of community level interaction is really part of the glue that keeps the country together, isn't it? It is, but I think it only is if you approach it from a certain mindset, right? And for me, what I've learned in working in communities, at least in New York, my whole career is you have to move at the speed of trust and you have to build trust. And as you build trust, communities will welcome you in and be more open to ideas or different ways of doing things. For us at NYRP, the gardens aren't just gardens. They're actually like community hubs. They're used for family gatherings, for cookouts, you know, uh, library story hours, school giveaway programs in communities. That's all done because we've built trust over time. I mean, it's probably no surprise 
that where our gardens are located are either in communities that suffered generations after redlining, right? And are still suffering because, you know, that caused environmental injustices, no question. So building trust and going in, you know, a community garden is not going to solve gun violence in the United States, but what it will do is open up conversation and build trust amongst disparate you know, groups or entities, especially in cities like New York, where there's it's constantly changing, right? The neighborhoods are constantly changing with people moving in and people moving out. And every time that happens, there needs to be almost a reunification of individuals. And the garden often provides that hub. How do you build trust when we have such a, a plethora of information that is coming in that grabs our attention that is based on distrust and based on on fear, uh, right? Based on grabbing attention. And the best way to grab attention is to make people afraid, right? How do you how do you create that balance? Um, are you encouraging Georg- Georgina uh, people to just sort of put aside their electronics and and actually talk to each other? Um, I, I know that's a that's that, that's a radical idea, right? We, right? we no longer like doing this, but we actually can look each other in the eye and smile at each other a little bit and not worry about whether the person is a Democrat or a Republican or whatever. Uh, you're just you're just digging in the dirt, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting. We uh, at Wasatch Community Gardens, we say under the right conditions, people and plants thrive. Right. And um, and I mean, technology itself, I, I think. Uh, thankfully, the nature of gardening, you kind of have to be all hands, all hands in, which lends um, yourself to kind of looking up and looking around. And we uh, our, our gardens, we have 18 community gardens right now. And, and the individuals of those gardens, um, you know, span generations, race, gender um, and ethnicity, countries of origin, how long they've been here. And what we see is important um, is is continuing to provide uh, instances where people can look up, look at each other in the eyes and speak to one another. Um, And so when we have our community gardens, they're really these these families, no matter how um, how diverse they are or their backgrounds are, they're getting together for their cleanup days. They're getting together for their community um, building days. And so we're really able to, the gardens itself, it's not something that Wasatch Community Gardens is doing um, uh, other than providing the space, is, is that the gardens themselves lend themselves to that kind of interaction. And we're there to steward and make sure that those spaces continue to be open and safe so that individuals can tap into that humanity that we all have and that I really see blossom in a garden without much um, urging if you can create that right environment, which is why I led with that in the right environment, people and plants can thrive. And so I think it's really building those safe environments. Um, and under, we're a 34 year old organization. Um, and as, as we grow, we see more and more our role in environmental justice, in food justice. And it's, it's continuing to allow ourselves to grow into that space and bringing those along who have been around for 30 years gardening with us, bringing them with us while we open ourselves up to even more um, opportunity for people to be their authentic selves and connect uh, with the humanity in each other. Actually talking to people as you're gardening is a form of political activism, right? It's not party politics. It's just community activism, right? Getting, making the community better. Let's go around the the room uh, one more time, starting with Lynn, uh, going to Linda, and then we'll give you the last word, Georgina. Let's talk a little bit about the next initiatives that you're going to be seeing unfolding in the next 12 to 18 months. Uh, Lynn, what are your what are your major priorities for the next 12 to 18 months? So at NYRP, um, our major priorities uh, are in a few different buckets. One, we want to continue to um, effectively steward 80 acres of parkland because within that 80 acres of parkland, there's reforestation project, there's shoreline mitigation and restoration. It's more than just managing the park. There's some quite large ecological 
uh, projects that we have ongoing there, including a living shoreline. So that's one piece. Another is the um, continued expansion of our Gardens for the City program. The demand to create new green spaces with partners in New York is great, far, far exceeds our ability to uh, capacity to deliver them. And so looking for creative partnerships on a community led basis to do that is important. And then third, we've every year been expanding um, our urban agriculture program um, because the demand there is is quite high as well. So those will be sort of the three core areas that we're going to be focusing on in addition to programming all of our portfolio gardens in our trust. And uh, uh, Linda, I, I can absolutely um, uh, vouch for the fact that there, there's so much interconnectivity uh, in Colorado. We, we just completed a search for the head of uh, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless. We're doing another uh, search for the governor on, on the arts side, galvanizing the arts ecosystem to position Colorado as a creative hub. These kinds of issues are all interconnected in terms of the strength of a state, in terms of attracting people and making the state uh, livable. Talk about your priorities for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, yeah, and thanks for helping those orgs here in Denver, <laughs> Colorado. Um, yeah, so Doug, uh, so we've been around um, about 45 years. We have about 193 gardens across six counties in Metro Denver at this point. Um, last year, we added, we, we, we sort of slowed down our garden building and our gardens come about when the community comes to us and we work with the landowners to, you know, to secure the land and, and build the gardens and put in place the human infrastructure to support them. Um, so we've slowed down the garden building, uh, but what we've really been uh, kicking off in the last couple of years is a food forest initiative. So we are adding uh, perennial food producing trees, bushes, and vines two existing dug gardens and two freestanding um, spaces. And what that does is that it enhances biodiversity. It enhances, you know, the, the, um, the here, it, it positively impacts the heat island effect, the canopy, you know, all the things that go with that. So that's been really, really exciting um, for us. So we're going to have 20 by the end of this year. And then we expect that initiative to continue. And it also brings in different people because we acknowledge not everyone's necessarily into gardening. So it brings different community members in. And also it's a legacy project that over time, you know, we expect these orchards to be in place in you know, 30, 40, 50 years, which is really wonderful. Impacts food access, impacts community building, impacts climate. So that's a big one. We've also been really focusing on um, equity across our network. We put in place a seasonal workforce called the Doug Corps that became an AmeriCorps program this year. So we are continuing with that. And that's just helping us create connection between the gardens uh, and then with the broader community. Uh, and then the final, there's, you know, of course, a million other things, but uh, final uh, sort of, you know, big rock that we're focusing on is actually, and, and this call is really great, is we're working on, on actually bringing together community garden organizations across the country um, and helping elevate this movement. So I look forward, hopefully, to further conversations with you, Georgina and Lynn. Um, you know, to really, because this is, this is a movement and this is something that really actually can lift up, you know, so many members of the community. So we're, we're really trying to facilitate more conversations like this, uh, you know, and, and, and shift community gardens from a nice to have to a, to a must have and a critical piece of the infrastructure of thriving cities. One of the things that I really love about the nonprofit sector, right? People aren't competing against each other. People are competing to help to even do better, to collaborate even more. Uh, Georgina, um, why, don't, why don't you give us the last word? Tell us what Wasatch Community Gardens plans uh, over the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, and I wanted to, to thank you, Mark, for bringing us together. Um, I'm sure we'll continue to talk after this. I've already heard so many cool initiatives happening within um, your organization. So thank you for sharing. Um, I, you know, I've spoken a little bit to some of the things we're looking at moving forward with productive green space. Um, we're 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 looking at moving our farm. We have an urban farm, 1.4 acres at the heart in the heart of the city, where we have a job training program where we um, employ women who are experiencing homelessness uh, to work on the farm and be matched with a, um, a longer term job in housing by the end of their cohort. We have to move that farm because it's uh, being developed. There's going to be a housing complex there. Um, and so in the next 18 months, we'll be moving our farm into a permanent 
um, location, which will allow us to grow our job training program and increase it to that um, that small farm incubator program where we can teach farmers as well uh, and continue to grow more food. Last year, we were able to grow enough and donate enough food to impact 42% of um, our unsheltered neighbors in the entire state last year. And so we want to be able to continue to grow that. We're also um, starting an advocacy and justice program uh, to really bring experts into our team who understand the intersectionality of the work that we're doing. Um, it is a movement as well as a moment right now that we're, <laughs> we're really seeing. And so we want to be able to bolster um, our, our organization with those experts and, and open our lens wider. Um, and finally, uh, Linda, we need to talk. We are also doing a food forest in the next 18 months. So I'd love to pick your brain. Um, we're going to be prioritizing uh, food forests and um, more public pick options in our gardens um, as we as we slow down on community gardens and see where those food access, excuse me, um, where those food access points uh, are lacking and and bolstering those programs so that we can be um, really speaking to food security uh, as well. So those those three are our focuses over the next few years. This is so important. It's, it's so important that we each learn a lot more about where our food comes from, that we don't blithely go in and find plastic wrapped um, foods that where we throw the plastic out, which, by the way, ends up in our foods. Um, and then we just consume and consume and consume without thinking about where that food is coming from, the water that is used, the fuel that is used for transportation, and the whole uh, life cycle, how can we actually in small and large ways affect our lives, our health, and our communities? Linda Kelly, Executive Director of the New York Restoration Project, Georgina Griffith Yates, Executive Director of the Wasatch Community Gardens, and Linda Apple, Lipsius, Executive Director of Denver Urban Gardens. Thank you so much for sharing the work of your people, your communities, your volunteers, your funders, your staffs, your boards. We really appreciate your expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.